right. Hello and welcome to my talk. I'm uh, Daniel Brockman. I work at Isovalent. I work on uh, Cilium itself and eBPF in the Linux kernel. I co-maintain it there and have been contrib contributing for a very long time. Um, today the talk is about turning up performance to 11. Um, I will talk about Cilium, a new Weave de um, device replacement uh, that we built and yeah, and going big with TCP. So really the goal or experiment I had for this talk was basically, I mean, wouldn't it be nice to just turn on the volume knob and improve your performance? Unfortunately, it's not always that nice, but uh, or always that easy. Um, but the question was really like, what would it take to really get to maximum performance? And yeah, first the question of why, why is it relevant in the first place? So the use, Use cases you might have might differ. So for example, one could be scale. You're adding more workloads to your Kubernetes environments. You're adding, you're connecting multiple clusters in a mesh and therefore also the, tra the traffic uh, that is being pushed around increases. Maybe, uh, maybe sustainability to better make use of your existing infrastructure or to reduce off or on-prem costs or performance. Uh, performance wise to reduce the RPC workload latencies or to better cope with potentially escalating bulk data demands that you have maybe from AI or machine learning workloads. Uh, actually for the latter, there's quite a big push in the industry right now. Uh, we see new NICs coming up with 800 gigabit and beyond, um, you know, a, a, like a big uh, hype around a, AI and, and, and machine learning to push uh, data center innovations uh, the hyperscalers are, uh, you know, increasing their capacity, and we even see switches coming up to the market with 50, 1.2 terabit per second, which is really crazy. Um, so the question here, coming back to the Kubernetes world, is uh, how would such a platform look like that would potentially be able to address those future demands? And and the more practical question uh, is how, like, what can we benefit from it today? and especially without having to rewrite existing applications, of course. If you look at the standard Kubernetes architecture or, or um, setup, so you have your host, there's the kubelet running, kubeproxy running, and if you deploy Cilium as a CNI, for example, there's a Cilium agent, uh, like the, the daemon itself, and a CNI plugin. So whenever there's a new pod that is being spawned up, it will basically give a handle of the network namespace of the pod to the CNI plugin. The CNI plugin will talk to RPC to the Cilium agent, and eventually it will set up networking devices, IP addressing, routing, and in our case also BPF programs. And then when traffic is uh, going in and out of the pod, it will basically use the, the upper stack um, IP forwarding layer net filter, routing, and so on. Um, yeah, there are a couple of problems with that if you look at the scalability and performance aspects of such a setup. Uh, one is the kube proxy scalability, so if you have a lot of services, um, you run into issues, but also routing uh, through the upper stack, which may not necessarily be very obvious. Um, there are potential reasons, so maybe initially you deployed a cluster and you just went with the defaults. Defaults are very conservative so that you can run on, the, um, on a big variety of uh, environments, all the kernels and so on. Or maybe you have custom NetFilter uh, rules uh, installed, so you have to go to a NetFilter, um, or you cannot replace QProxy for one reason or another. Uh, with the queue proxy, I mean, we, we, pr probably many of you know it from the, from debugging, uh, troubleshooting, and production. Um, so you know, when when you have a lot of services, then it's like a linear walk, uh, trying to match uh, one of the service tuples. So it can it can be quite some overhead. Uh, upper stack, um, there's something when the packet leaves the pod on the egress direction. When you go to the upper stack, there's something in the kernel that is called SKB orphan. Uh, for example, when you have TCP traffic, the, that is basically there to, um, you know, tell the TCP stack that the network packet already left the node. And as you can see, it's not actually happen. It's not actually the case what, because the packet is still inside the host namespace. And 
that is essentially there and it's hard to remove because of net filters or net filter T proxy relies on it. Um, but doing that too soon before the packet actually left the node uh, basically breaks TCP back pressure because TCP, the TCP stack things packet already left the node. I can push more and because of that you can evade the send buffer limits. And when you look at the uh, performance, uh, what you can see here on the right side, the yellow bar, is when the, when the application is inside the host itself and you do like a TCP stream workload test with a 100 gig NIC um, over wire. So I had like two machines back to back um, with uh, 8K MTU. You reach 100 gigabit per second. Uh, but if you look at uh, the upper stack forwarding with the Weave devices, it's not that great. Um, it's 63 gigabit, and the reason is because TCP back pressure breaks. So the question is really, can we achieve the same for Kubernetes pods as well? Um, the answer is yes, uh, and I will take you to this journey that we did. Um, so yeah, com coming back um, in, in our journey initially, uh, when we uh, worked in Cilium in the early days, the first thing we did was uh, Repl uh, replacing the kube proxy component uh, with the BPF based implementation in order to be better scalable. That, that, that covers all the Kubernetes service types. Um, for the north south direction, we have a per packet uh, load balancing uh, at the TC BPF layer. What you can see here, uh, Cilium agent, when it, when it spawns up, it's attaching BPF programs on the physical devices in the TC BPF layer of the stack. In east-west, uh, we got rid of the per packet net and are doing the backend selection at the connect time. And we also have maglev and host port support. The next logical thing after that was basically to add support for XTP-based service load balancing. Given we already had the load balancer in the TC side, now it's, it was just a matter of porting that over to XTP. XTP is a um, it's called Express Data Path, and it's basically an attachment point inside the driver where you can build high-performance load balancing um, so, that you, so that essentially you can co-locate, co easily co-locate workloads and still have the high-performance aspect uh, um, to better scale out. That also covers all the Kubernetes services, and we also have Marklev and DSR support for this. There was a nice blog post on the Cilium uh, website with a production uh, graph. So what you can see here from uh, is a test run where initially there was IP I IPVS in production, then it got moved over to a single node for the layer for load balancing with XTP. And what you can see is the, here the CPU overhead. So it's just really minimal. And once it was taken out again from production and moved back to IPVS, actually two nodes handling that production traffic, it, it went really high again. So XTP really allows for low overhead because it's so early uh, inside the receive path. The next step that um, we thought um, was is really useful uh, performance-wise was to add a bandwidth manager to Cilium. Um, the, the idea of the bandwidth manager is basically that we support egress bandwidth limits in Cilium so that you can say, okay, for this kind of part, I want to have 50 megabit, for other parts, 100, whatever, so that you have a scalable egress rate limiting. And the way this basically works is that the Cilium agent, it sets up, um, on, a, on a NIC, you typically have multi-queue on the, on the on transmit side, and it sets up the FQ scheduler. It's called fair queue scheduler in the kernel. And we have a BPF program which basically tells that scheduler the departure time of the packet so that you can configure, so that you can set this departure time based on the rate you want to have. And this allows for uh, potentially lockless, uh, like lockless rate limiting. And what you can see here, uh, in this graph is on the yellow bar is like the, the classical way uh, to, to uh, achieve rate limiting, for example, hierarchical token bucket. Um, that's the usual way in the Linux kernel. 
And thanks to the FQ QDisk and setting the timestamps in eBPF, the earliest departure time, uh, you can get a, you know, a more than 4x better P99 latency for that. So it's really nice uh, in this aspect. It's not the only advantage that, uh, that this, uh, the bandwidth manager provides because um, one thing that we added in the kernel 519 uh, colleague from Facebook and, and myself, we ran some experiments and fixed that in the stack, was that basically when you have applications inside the pod and you would like to use BBR congestion control, that's the congestion control algorithm for TCP, which was developed by Google. Um, it's called, I think, uh, bottleneck bandwidth and RTT. So it uses a different congestion signal uh, than the default cubic one, which is loss-based. Um, the problem here is it was not possible before to use that for pods because whenever a network packet traverses the network namespace, the timestamp, the departure timestamp that the congestion control algorithm would set is basically being cleared. Um, and the fix in the kernel that we did uh, basically then unlocked this and then you can use BBR uh, from pods and benefit from that. And FQ scheduler from the bandwidth manager is basically able to then schedule the packet at the right time. At KubeCon, uh, some uh, years ago, I did a demo where I compared BBR versus the default cubic uh, over a lossy network. For example, when you're consuming services from a Kubernetes cluster from mobile device or, or elsewhere, or like over Wi-Fi, for example. Uh, we had a streaming demo where the streaming application was inside a pod, the server, and over the lossy network, what you could see is that the BBR, with BBR, it was staying in high definition, the video, and with the default, it was falling back to the low resolution because the, uh, the, the TCP congestion window was reduced too aggressively. Um, so that's the bandwidth manager. The next uh, feature that we uh, added to Cilium was, is called BPF host routing. So the whole idea there is basically, well, don't use the upper stack for routing. Uh, we can do all the routing in TC BPF layer. And we can also make use of, you know, the kernel facilities like the, the kernel routing table and so on out of BPF uh, because it's there as a helper to utilize. So your routing daemons can still work and um, uh, you can benefit from this uh, without go having to go to the upper stack. Uh, so there's uh, two new helpers in BPF on the kernel side that they added. One is called BPF redirect peer. The other one is called BPF redirect neighbor. Uh, the redirect peer is basically for the logical in ingress path into the pod. It allows a fast uh, network namespace switch from the ingress side to the ingress side of the weave device. Basically, um, what happens here internally in, in the kernel is it just resets the device pointers from the physical device to the weave device that is inside the pod, and then does another loop in the main receive loop in the kernel instead of having to go to the weave device where it would enqueue uh, the packet in a per CPU backlog queue and it will add more latency um, and, it, and, it, and it is slower. For, so, so that's basically the, the kernel internals if you're interested. Um, the egress side, so the new helper here would basically allow you to inject the packet into the layer two of the kernel, in, into the neighboring subsystem, and it would help to resolve you know, the, the MAC addresses for the source and destination MAC addresses, and this can be combined with the FIP lookup that is in BPF uh, in, inside the kernel um, yeah, to basically ad, um, achieve the, the outgoing path as well. And the interesting thing here is, uh, given this bypasses the upper stack, there's also not this problem that I mentioned earlier where you would SKP orphan the packet. So basically this fixes the TCP back pressure issue um, that was there before. So this is how the complete picture looks here. And if you look into the performance uh, numbers again, this allows to push the, the TCP bulk stream workload to 90 gigabit per second instead of 63. So this gives a huge performance advantage. It's still not perfect. What you can see here, it's not 100% on par with what you have if, as if the application is inside the host itself. Um, so there are more pieces to the puzzle. <laughs> um, the next one uh, that 
uh, I added into the kernel um, this summer, actually, is called TCX. So TCX is, in short, um, called an express uh, data path for TC. So basically, a new design for the TC data path. Why? Uh, because it is really crucial. It's, it's the foundation for Cilium, where we attach everything um, uh, like in, 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 the, in the main data path that we have in, in, in the kernel. And to make it more efficient, to make it more modern, and also more robust. For example, we see more and more users that are using the uh, TC data path, so that when there are multiple users, so that they don't step onto each other. Uh, that's, that got support with BPF link, which is a, a BPF concept that hasn't been added uh, to TC, given its internals. Um, more efficient fast path, and then also dependency controls where you can say, okay, I want to attach my program before or after that other program so that you have like a relative attachment point and it's uh, from a user perspective nicer than what you had before with the old style TC. So yeah, like like back in the days when in 2015 uh, I added the initial uh, support for TC BPF, it was like the most natural fit at the time, but now like uh, making this more modern was a, it was a yeah, good point in time to actually tackle that. With that, um, uh, I also added the framework inside the kernel, which is called BPF MPROC. So like a multi-attach uh, layer where multiple uh, BPF programs can be attached in an efficient way in an array. An array is more cache line friendly than a linked list, for example, where you would have more cache misses. And this framework, the goal of this was basically to provide a common you know, look and feel from an API perspective, because the idea was not to just have it for TCX, but also have it in other attached locations, for example, XTP um, in, in the future, so that we support multiple programs at the XTP layer. Uh, NetKit devices, this is something that I will mention later, and uh, C groups and, and, and so on. Um, so just to give you the picture, this is how it looked like. Old style, like the classic uh, TC, uh, uh, you know, example picture where you have this, you know, fake queue disk on ingress and egress, which actually doesn't do any, you know, queuing in that sense. Uh, it just basically is a container structure for BPF programs or like for the old style uh, TC that was there also before BPF. And this got really simplified into more efficient array and then like an efficient entry point for for BPF. And with that, like from a, from a micro benchmark perspective, uh, the entry into a BPF program got reduced into half. Uh, so we could cut the cycles into half when the cache is hot. And I think the benefits will be uh, even better when you don't always have a hot, um, the, data's, the data hot in the cache. So yeah. Um, so now that it's moved to uh, TCX for the physical devices, for the Weave devices, the next step in that journey that got merged recently is basically to replace the Weave devices. Uh, we uh, replaced this with something that is called NetKit. Um, and the whole idea here is basically that uh, for Weave devices, there's still this point where we have the logical egress path uh, for traffic going out of pods, where it has to take a, a queue, like a per CPU backlog queue. Um, this is something that is internal to the Weave driver in the kernel, but it adds latency. And the whole idea is basically to move that BPF program uh, that we have in Cilium that is attached on the host side of the Weave device into the pod, but into the device in the pod so that uh, applications, they cannot unload this, uh, and the, we move the BPF program closer to the source. And in the BPF program, uh, when we know that we want to push the traffic out of the node, uh, the whole idea is then we can directly forward it without having to go to this per CPU backlog queue. So we can remove this, uh, this additional, this artificial inefficiency, basically. And the other thing, that it, it, it was interesting while working on this is, 
yeah, why not make this an L3 device from the beginning, right? Because Weave is uh, L2, so you need to have some ARP resolver as well, but we can just get rid of this as well. So this got merged just recently, not too long ago. And it's interesting to compare this to Weave and also IPVLAN. How does it basically uh, stand against those two? So Weave, as I mentioned, is L2. IPv LAN L3, and we also wanted to have this as an L3 device so that you don't need to resolve ARP uh, from, the, from the pod side. Um, for Weave and NetKit, this is both like a, like, a, like a main device and a peer device. IPv LAN works a little bit different, so you have to make one of your physical devices the master device in IPv LAN, and then you can add IPv LAN slave devices, uh, which you then move into the network namespaces. But uh, yeah, the BPF program, uh, like the programming for IPVLAN is a bit of a hassle because in Cilium we once had IPVLAN support, but later on we removed it again. But basically when you want to do policy enforcement, um, we, back then we added the BPF program into the IPVLAN uh, device that is inside the pod, but it is a problem, right? Because an application could just remove it again if it has the rights to do so. And this is something that we definitely wanted to avoid. Or um, if you don't add this inside the pod, then the normal default IPVLAN mode, it, it could be that this IPVLAN device could just talk to this IPVLAN device directly without going somehow to the host. So you cannot do any policy enforcement. So this is another hassle. So essentially you have to add this to the physical device and attach your BPF program there for all the different parts. Um, but then the problem is users, they don't only have one physical device. I mean, this is one use case, but there can also be multiple ones. And then you have to pick, and then you have to make, then you have to add, for example, a dummy device and make this your master device. And then it, it gets complicated very quickly. So basically what we wanted to have, this nice uh, model for the Weave devices, where you have one in the host, one in the pod, and it's quite flexible. So we also added, so we also had this for NetKit. And yeah, then what I mentioned, it allows this fast uh, network namespace switch and egress. Um, you can combine this with the FIP lookup. In the case of IPVLAN, uh, it is, I would say, slightly less efficient in this regard because if you look into the IPVLAN code, it has an internal FIP that is not using the kernel FIP uh, just for internal routing, whether a packet has to go to outside of the node or to another IPVLAN device in a different part. So it has like an internal hash table where it does the lookup. And then when you want, actually want to route the traffic out of the node, there's an additional kernel FIP lookup. So you can get rid of those two and only have the one in NetKit. Or if you have a use case where you actually don't need to do a FIP lookup, you can just direct it out of the node uh, without having to do that. So you're more flexible in this, in this sense. So it basically takes the best of both worlds. And if you look at the performance side, if you look at the flame graphs, the problem that you sometimes see under pressure with Weave devices, so basically here you have an application, it's, it's sending something, uh, it will at some point queue the packet to the per CPU backlog queue, what I mentioned earlier, and then another thread will pick it up and process it from there and then send it out, right? So oftentimes this can be deferred to the kernel soft IRQ daemon, and that's not really nice. Uh, so basically what we want is what is shown here on the right side in case of NetKit, um, that it remains all the way in the process context uh, when you want to send the packet out of the node. So that also the process scheduler in the kernel can account that time better and can make better scheduling decisions. And if you look at the performance, now we see, you, you see this purple bar that is added and you can see, okay, now the throughput is as high as it is on the, on, on the host, right? So it gives you the, the full uh, power. Same for latency, uh, P99 latency is as low as it is on the host. So it is, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, so now we have uh, zero overhead for networking for pods. So the question is, can we push, can we push even further? <laughs> We're not stopping here. <laughs> uh, so there's an interesting technology that was added uh, to the kernel from, from Google engineers, uh, from the TCP maintainers, uh, technology that's called Big TCP. And that was initially merged for IPv6 first. Uh, I mean, because most of the, I think, Google traffic is running on, on IPv6. It was merged in 5.19, and later on it also got added for IPv4, I mean, uh, for the rest of the world. <laughs> um, and the interesting thing, the, the idea on, on big TCP is basically to um, aggregate more and, and, and to be able to better cope with, uh, with the demands on future NICs, right? So 200, 400 gigabit and beyond. So with those speeds. Um, in Cilium, uh, we added support for this because I think it's a feature, I mean, that is very interesting and that, that gives you a nice performance boost. Um, there's actually no changes that you need to do on your network on the MTU. Uh, all of this is basically done on the local host. And uh, so it will try to aggregate from many small packets, like a big packet and push it up. And when we added this uh, for IPv4, uh, like some of the drivers, they have different limits um, that they expose. And there was a nice uh, uh, comment from an, from an Intel engineer uh, when we got the ICE support added, which is like 400 gigabit NICs. Uh, it actually improved their request response rate when you have it off versus have it on by 75%. So this is really impressive. Um, the way this works, as I mentioned, right? So this is a typical picture of the networking stack. Um, what you can see here in those red box is the GRO engine. Uh, it's called generic receive offload. And basically what this is trying to do is it will take MTU sized packets when you have a TCP packet stream and it will aggregate small packets into a bigger packet. Here it's 64K and will push only one big packet to the upper stack so that you can save resources that you don't have to process something n times just once. And the same is also the case for the egress path of the stack. So it will push down a supersized packet and then either in software, but most network cards support this also in hardware. This is called TSO, the transmit segmentation offload. It will then chunk up this packet and push it out in small packets. And yeah, and then when you receive it somewhere else on the on the node, the same happens again, right? GEO will try to aggregate and so on and push it up the stack. The whole problem with this is the 64K is basically an upper size limit because what the kernel is trying to do is it like the IP header has a total header length and that's 16 bit and therefore the upper size limit is 64K. Um, and big TCP basically has a way to overcome this because for example, for IPv6, it will insert a hop by hop header in the kernel uh, as a Joomba gram and then you have 32 bit length. So you can have much bigger aggregation limits. And yeah, what we did in Cilium, uh, this is in Cilium 114, it supports both IPv4 and IPv6. We did some measurements and 192K was a uh, sweet spot where you had most of the performance gains that we saw. Um, and that's what basically Cilium will set up underneath. So it will, uh, it will set up the physical devices for, for, for that aggregation and also all the devices on the pods, right? And yeah, it has probing as well because uh, the Mellanox NICs that we have uh, they have much higher limit for the transmit segmentation offload. Uh, so 192K can easily be supported. For the Intel ones, they are slightly lower. They have 128K. Uh, so that's why we added probing uh, to that. So that it lowers this slightly to still support other NICs as well. And yeah, so the running performance benchmarks, uh, the blue bar, what you can see here is the latency in microseconds. Uh, so we can, from having it disabled to having it enabled, gives it 2x better P99 latency. 
So even the request response type workloads, they benefit from that. Uh, the TCP stream workloads um, as well. I mean, uh, yeah, it would be nice to have like a larger NIX <laughs> to, 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 to test out. Um, but you can definitely see the improvements. And the transactions per second from for a request response type workload, they also improve very significantly. So this is a really nice feature. Um, and it's, it's a low hanging fruit, right? Because it's a, uh, to, to enable it. So yeah, that's basically the, the complete picture of our journey. Uh, in the future, we are also looking into other features that are currently that, that have been merged just recently or that are merged more in the future. Just recently, there's the TCP microsecond timestamp resolution, so that is interesting as well. Um, I think we will, I'm very, very uh, I will look into that to add this into Cilium as well. Um, and then BBR v3, so that's uh, basically an improved uh, version of uh, the BBR TCP congestion control to basically address the, the, the relatively high retransmission rate. Um, so there's still some discussions, but I think this will be, as far as I'm aware, upstreamed uh, very soon. So yeah, to conclude, uh, yeah, no, so with some of the improvements we did from the EPPF and Cilium side, we can get rid of the NetNS, of the network namespace overhead for Kubernetes pods, and to be able to better deal with 100 gigabit and beyond, there's big TCP, which is a very interesting feature um, where you don't have to change the, the, the network or anything like that, but you can just benefit from it uh, with, a, with the software change. And to go even higher than that, even beyond that, uh, that's still work in progress on the kernel side. Uh, that would very likely be t uh, TCP zero copy, because if you look into the uh, remaining uh, performance uh, uh, overhead. When you only have big TCP, then it's mostly on the copy side to copy the data from the kernel to the host, and then TCP zero copy comes into play, right? Um, we had in Paris a few weeks ago a NetConf workshop where the you know kernel developers from the community met up and. Um, yeah, so there are some interesting features, but they are still in the works, right? So for TCP zero copy, what would be needed is a support for header data split in the kernel. Right now, it doesn't really have a good framework to configure it or to even see whether devices support this. Um, this is going to come. Header data split is needed because you want to separate the headers on one page and then the data that you then want to memory map uh, to an application to on, uh, like to, to page aligned, uh, you know, pages uh, for the application. Um, then the combination of big TCP and TCP zero copy is really interesting because this gives uh, very low overhead for transferring megabytes of data. Um, and then the, 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 like then what is really interesting for AI and machine learning workloads is basically to memory map this into the GPU memory, right? So that you don't have this detour through the host, through the host CPU. Um, there's also patches that are right now under discussion in the kernel mailing list. But yeah, so with that, uh, my talk is concluded. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. <clears throat> So a lot of the uh, optimizations that you mentioned today require um, relatively recent kernel versions. Does Cilium detect which features are available based on kernel version, or does it have like much stricter minimum kernel requirements now? Yeah, I mean, like the minimum kernel requirements for Cilium is right now 419. So it's really old. I mean, we like b before that, we had 4.9. We recently bumped that because 4.9 is um, I think out of out of date. I mean, it's super old. Um, but yeah, I mean, we basically uh, detect whether a feature can be used, and it's also 
up to the user, like depending on what kind of setup they, or like what kind of constraints they have and so on. So you can opt into this. Yeah. Thanks for your presentation. You, the big TCP example, you say you could turn it on and off. Of course, we're on Cilium uh, 114.3. Um, how do you turn it on and off? Because in the values of YAML file, what flag are we, are we looking for? Okay. Uh, uh, it, so it, it, it should be in the documentation of Cilium. There's a flag in Helm, and I don't have it in my head right now. Um, but I have linked it here. Uh, so it's actually in the slides if you want to look it up. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have one question. Uh, so the standard use case is to have like Kubernetes uh, in a VM, right? Uh, in in a public cloud, so mm -hmm. usually, yeah, yeah. Does all this somehow uh, work there as well? Yeah, it does. It does. And um, so for I mean, like even the XTP based load balancing, a lot of public cloud providers they offer SIUV based networking, and then you get, for example, for the Mellanox or, or Intel, you can attach XTP natively there, so that's no problem. Okay, that's and exactly what I was yeah. looking for. Okay, and, cool. and all the improvements that I mentioned here, like with the weave device replacement, bandwidth manager, and so on and so forth, also big TCP, they also work all on the public cloud. So, yeah. Hi, um, same question, what about VMware? Say again? Any issues with all these uh, options on uh, Open vSwitch with VMware? Oh, um, so the Open vSwitch is, uh, I mean, yeah with, yeah, with Open vSwitch, you, I'm not, I mean, Cilium doesn't support Open vSwitch, right? So Open vSwitch is a different data path uh, technology compared to eBPF. Uh, but I presume maybe you mean, you, you, you meant OpenShift, right? If I'm, Okay, <laughs> yeah, we, we can take it offline, it's, it's fine. Yeah. I think the question was about uh, VMware for virtualization device or network device that most of those features don't work there. You need the SRIV from your future partners. That's the question. You mean the SAUV that, that, that uh, did you require? You that native virtualization, network virtualization device in uh, vSphere doesn't support any of those features. Okay, I mean, I'm not too familiar with vSphere, to be honest, um, but the XTP one is, is, is the only one where you have specific NIC requirements. And yeah, and it doesn't support it. So yeah. if you want to access that on VMware, you need to set up your machines with SRIV okay. so that you can use native, native NIC drivers. Yeah, all right. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so my question is like, if we have a multi-tenancy and we are doing stuff EBPF, EBPF on the kernel, right? Are there any security concerns there? I mean, like, uh, so, so EBPF itself is set up from Cilium as the CNI, right? And there's just one CNI running there and that's setting up the programs inside the host. EBPF programs, when they are pushed into the kernel, they are being uh, verified for safety so that you don't do harm to the kernel. So basically the verifier will do a static analysis of the program to understand what the program is doing and reject it. Um, and that is basically also restricted to root only. So basically um, applications in the, in the cube system um, namespace uh, will be able to use it, such as Cilium, for example, but other application parts, not really. So, yeah. Thank you. All right, one more question. Uh, one for presentation, and uh, as I know, the big TCD uh, IPv6 will set the uh, lens field to narrow in the uh, header and add some extension header in the uh, IPv2 uh, header. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, so if, if uh, a server run outside the cluster and uh, no big TCP, uh, if, uh, and the client run in the pod in the cluster and uh, uh, the big TCP, t big TCP is enabled, could, can you can, can run, uh, communicate with each other? And if, if, if not, how to solve this issue? 
Can they can can they do what? Can you repeat can, the last? Can they communicate with each other? Oh yeah, yeah. This uh, extension header that is being added is only local on the host, right? So it's not going out to the network. So this is really only in order to push a larger packet up the stack. But other than that, um, it's not going onto the wire. Oh, thank you. So I, I, I didn't find the question in the Cilium's document, so I asked this okay. today. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, quick question about Express Data Path um, versus sort of eBPF. What led to your decision to use that uh, as a load balancing? Um, piece. Yeah, so the express data path, I mean, that's basically an attachment layer for eBPF inside the driver. And I mean, all the major drivers by now do support it. Um, so, I mean, given we initially implemented this, uh, like the service load balancing and so on with the TC BPF, the XDP uh, extension to be able to use that was a natural fit, uh, given you can benefit so much from it uh, because the overhead is so low. And yeah, what, 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 why? I mean, because you can move this closer to the closer to the source, right? So that's like really the first possible point in the software stack where something can be processed, where something gets picked up from the driver, from the receive rings, and you can run and do some actions with it. So yeah, it was a natural fit. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was just under the impression that was sort of like an Intel. Um, Express data path piece. Ah, no, no, no. Yeah, okay. I mean, all major vendors, they support XDP, also cloud providers as well. Okay, gotcha. Okay, yeah. cool. That, that makes sense then. Thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you very much.